Introduction to Grace. But I get this, it's interesting that when they first came out, the, the title of my, my topic was What Grace Is Not, and then they re rewrote it and they thought maybe that sounds a little bit too negative. But somebody changed it, it was Grace Misunderstood. But when I think of great, what grace is not, I feel like, I think I'm the perfect person to teach this class because I know all about what grace is not because I've done it all. <laughs> My whole Christian walk has been such a struggle. And this idea of grace being freely given, and that, that is so hard for me to innately accept in our human flesh, we want to earn something, to do something, or think we should be if we're not, and it's just, it's just so into how we're made. You know, Paul does such a great job when he talks about it being freely, and, and Mira talked about some of these things, like in Romans, you know, we are justified freely by his grace. Um, and uh, in Romans, and then in 1 Corinthians, says God has freely given us. And then even later in Ephesians, he says to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Free of charge. It's the get out of jail free card. Yeah. It's, uh, but it goes so against ourselves. And we see it all through the scriptures. We see it. You know, when Jesus is telling his parable, so much, often you see that coming out. Like in Luke 15, the prodigal son. Yeah. The older brother. We, I can relate to the older brother. Can anybody else relate to the older brother? <laughs> You think, well, he gets rewarded for messing everything up? That just doesn't even make sense to us. You know, even when in the parable, in, in, um, where is it, Matthew 20, when it talks about the parable of the vineyard, when the, man, the employer goes out very early in the morning and says, I'll hire you for the day, and here's one denarius. And then he goes out again at 9 a.m., and then noon and then 3 p.m., and then even 5 p.m. right before the end of the day, and then pays them in reverse. Here's your one denarius. Okay, and then here's your one. And then, of course, the ones that work the entire, surely they're going to get more, and they get their one denarius. That, doesn't that get under your skin? <laughs> I think, what in the world? But, you know, he says, are you envious because I am so generous? Did you not agree to work for one denarius? We just don't get this part of God's heart in the flesh. But we've got to fight for this. I can totally relate to this. Um, I remember when I was single um, and had a household. I was before I was um, a disciple, and uh, I it was in Washington, D.C., and I thought I got this great deal. It was like three fifty dollars um, around in Northern Virginia plus utilities uh, with all these things. I thought, this is a good deal. Um, and uh, so I was totally fine with that. But then, then I found out the woman who was the main person on the lease who had the master bedroom, the only parking lot, wasn't paying utilities, and she wasn't paying even half of what I was paying. And then all of a sudden, my deal didn't look so good. <laughs> but did I not agree? I remember my mom saying to me, she's like, didn't she agree to pay that? That's her. I mean, that's a smart businesswoman. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, no, that's not fair. We just we want things to be fair, but we don't. We want mercy, but we want justice for everybody else. Um, but I think there are certain symptoms that we have um, when we don't understand grace, and I can relate to all of these. Uh, turn with me to Matthew 18. That was the parable of the uh, prodigal son. Now we're going to go to another parable here. It's the parable of the unmerciful servant, starting in verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, seven times would have been quite generous. The rabbi of those days would, would probably say something like three. So Peter is my probably thinking, like, wow, I'm being very generous here. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. There's a little background. A talent is 75 pounds uh, of, of it's, a, it's like a coin, but it's not exactly a coin, but it's, it's basically
basically, one talent is equal to about 20 years wages. 20 year wages. So 10,000 uh, talents would be equivalent to about six billion dollars of today money. Six billion. I think in the NIV it says millions of dollars. Actually, if you do it monetarily, about six billion. That's a lot. Um, so this is his debt. I don't know, who knows what he did to get in that kind of debt. What was brought to him, since he was not able to pay the master order that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. Now the people of the day would understand this concept. There is, this truly happened, indentured servants. You couldn't pay, and it's one thing, especially as the head of the family, like not only has his debt, but now it's not like, there's no declaring bankruptcy. It's like, you're gonna be a slave. Not only you, but your wife, and the worst part, even your kids. This is intense. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a few hundred dollars. A denarii, one denarii is about one day's wage. Um, he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused, instead he went off and the man had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. <coughs> the biggest symptom I think of not understanding grace is that we don't give it out. We can become harsh. And, and if you look at the first, when he says, be patient with me and I will pay it back, really? You're going to pay $6 billion. I want to know what occupation he had back then that's going to pay out $6 billion. He's either in, in some sort of delay tactic or very deceived about the debt he had. And I think when it comes to us, when we, we don't get the, the depth of our our debt and that's why it's so important we study the Bible to get that debt but it doesn't it's not just then we have to continue to do it to understand the debt so we can see the lavishness of God's grace um, you know why do people why do people have a hard time forgiving mainly because we probably don't see our debt the other part is that we have to overcome this innate sense of fairness because forgiveness costs that sense of fairness. We have to actually give it up to forgive. Um, but this, it's so interesting, all around the world, all cultures, there is something deep inside of us where we want to be forgiven. And then we also need to forgive others, every one of us. Now, we can end up on either side of this where we are struggling more with feeling guilty all the time um, and then the other times we're just filled with resentment and bitterness. And we try to submerge that down as much as we can, and then it pops right back up. And it pops right back up. You know, I think uh, I was reading something that described it as like a beach ball underneath, keeping a beach ball under the water. And uh, if you've ever tried to do that, it, it's really hard to keep a beach ball, one of those big beach balls under the water, it keeps popping back up. But when you finally let it go up and you realize like, it's actually quite light, but it took so much energy keeping it down. And we've got to figure out how to comprehend this grace because it's so light when we get it. And we can work through all these things. Um, Ernest Hemingway, and some of you probably know this story. He wrote this story um, called The Capital of the World. Has anybody heard of this? It's a short story. But in it, it's a father who has been, they have a restrained relationship, a strained relationship with the son, and uh, he ran away. The son is gone, just left, nowhere to be seen for years. Um, and the despairing father, uh, at one point, just really missed him, decides, I'm gonna just 
I'm just going to take an advertisement in the local newspaper. And he's going to write something and hope that his son will read it. And he writes in the local paper, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. Now, Papa, this is in Madrid. The story takes place in Madrid. And Paco is a, a very common name in Spain. And when the father went to the hotel the next day, there were 800 men named Paco waiting for their forgiving fathers. You know, down deep, we just desire this deep forgiveness. Um, and, and it is that sense of like, we, we all need it. And then when we hear stories where somebody's truly forgiven something, nothing brings tears to our eyes more than when we, like there, there was back when the, um, it was a few years ago, when it was an Amish community. Uh, do you remember this? When the man went in and uh, he killed all the children in the execution style, and um, it was just horrific. But the very first thing, when the parents find out, the, the women, the mothers of the children that were murdered, they go over to the wife of the husband who did this and says, we want you to know that we forgive him. And, uh, and, and when asked, uh, the community asked, like, how can you do that? And they said, we don't have an option. According to our religion, we have to forgive. And I think, ooh, that is our religion. Um, but we do, we just, you know, I'll never forget that story. We love forgiveness. It's just so hard for sometimes to get it. But when, when we feel, you know, either side, when we're feeling like we can't forgive or uh, needing a forgiveness, we, we have a misunderstanding of grace, and we've got to get deeper. Um, another, another thing, this is, um, this is the description of, or a picture of somebody. You know, this, I, when I first got married, I didn't know how unforgiven I was until I got married. <laughs> and I thought, it must just be coming up right now, because I've always been very forgiving. <laughs> Marriage exposes. It's a really good mirror. I just had to see, look inside, but... I just wasn't very good at giving out grace. I remember people sitting down like, you don't get grace. So I went through every passage in the Bible, those 218, I went through every single solitary verse in the Old and New Testament and just tried to understand grace. I read the book, J.I. Packer, Knowing God. I thought, I need to know that this is a character of God. I don't get it. It was such a struggle for me. Um, but I think when we start seeing our need more, the more we see our need, the more we desire the more we desire something when we actually get it, the more grateful we are. Yeah. So it always goes back to seeing our need. It's, it's so interesting uh, when you think you've lost, I mean, even for a moment, just imagine you've lost grace. Just imagine, you, you can't, grace is no longer tangible. Think how hopeless we would be. It's, it's like that Hebrews 10, a fearful expectation of the raging fire, never to see God's face. You know, but unless we imagine what it would be like without, sometimes we don't realize how much it's worth. Yeah. And, and I think this is true. You know, you think of a, think of a, a husband and wife, and Valentine's came and went, and, you know, we're, some of the wives were confessing things like, well, I just kind of expected my husband to make it a little bit more special for me. Or, um, and they were kind of struggling in that entitlement and all that stuff that we can get. And, but imagine somebody like that. But then they're, they're, they're having these little tiffs and, they're stuck in this, you know, the back-to-back -back and have trouble having grace and feeling like, well, he doesn't really love me. He's not taking care of me. But imagine he goes overseas now. And during that war, and you hear in the news, the helicopter crashes. And when you get that news, your heart sinks. And you find out that, yes, he was on that helicopter. And there's weeping. There's anguish. There's just imagine just that you're, this is your best friend, your husband, the father of your children. I mean, the deep agony and weeping. But then imagine, a couple days later, you find out it was the wrong helicopter. And he comes home. How grateful. What's the joy like? It's when you understand that you didn't have it and then you have it. Yeah. It's like, would you lose something and then you find it? When you find it, it's almost way more excitable than, than when you first got in the first place. <laughs> if you've ever lost something and found it, you're like, oh, I'm so glad I got this back, something of value. Yeah. 
but we've got to fight for this understanding of God's grace so that we too can give it out. Um, another symptom, so it's not only unforgiving is a big symptom, not being able to give grace out. If you're a person that has trouble giving out grace, there is some misunderstanding you have of, of either your debt or holding on or just understanding what grace is. Another thing, and this is something that I've had to work through, is this, another symptom is performance oriented. Now our lives from, if you've grown up in this country, our life, everything is about performance. You get, a, you get grades, <laughs> you know, even in, you know, recently they've tried to take some of that out, but you get grades. I think for me, I was in school for a long time between, you know, school and undergrad and grad school, all those things. So it was a lot in tests, lots of tests. You get graded on everything. And then of course I was in band too. Um, be, be, how you perform based, gave you your seat, your awards, track. How to pick a sport that's so individualistic, you know, it's not even like you have teams supposedly, but you're out there for yourself. <laughs> you want to win that race. <laughs> you know, um, you're happy for your team when you win, but you're, you're out there for yourself. It's like the performance orientation. And, um, the, I, I, am a, I am a sticky person. I like, I like boxes and checks. This is how my life goes. This is the way I think. We know that we have this type of attitude and we misunderstand grace this way when it's a I have to versus I get to. You know, if we could just understand, you know, and God, you know, it, it's like God is, his holiness and righteousness is so way over there. And then we're kind of like this big glob over here. You know, there's no differentiating. We think we're better or worse than people. No, we're just this big glob over here in the flesh. And God must think it's so crazy. We start comparing ourselves and we think we're better or worse. And he must just laugh at that. The standard is God. And if we could just understand in Isaiah 64, 6, it says, All of us become like the one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like a wind, and like our wind, our sins sweep us away. Like even our righteous acts. Um, you know, when I think about something that seems so ridiculous, that God must laugh, because I do this. We all, I'm sure a lot of us at some point, we like, I just gotta either earn my salvation or pay it back. You know, that there's something that we have inside of us and, and even to give us a perspective, I think about the Grand Canyon. It's 18 miles wide. And I think trying to either earn or repay grace would be like jumping across the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Completely impossible. I think about, you know, Mike Powell broke the world uh, long jump record in Tokyo. It was in 1991. And the, one, the record before that was uh, 23 years before. Now, Mike Powell was able to jump um, he was able to jump 29 feet and four and a half inches. 23 years before that, Ralph Austin jumped 29 feet two and a quarter inches. Okay, 18 miles is 95,000 miles. Can you imagine if I thought, I'm gonna practice every day for the rest of my life to see one day I'm gonna jump across that Grand Canyon. That's how ridiculous it is when we're trying to earn or repay grace. Now, I know we don't have those actual thoughts in our head, but when we get performance oriented, that's how ridiculous it is. And I'm totally like that. But then you look at the scriptures. You know, God doesn't need us to do anything. He wants our hearts. He wants a broken and a contrite heart who says, help, I can't do this without you. Think about it. Think about the thief on the cross. What did he do? He said, remember me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Help. What about the beggar Lazarus? In Luke 16, what did he do? We've got to understand this. We've got to get this. It's not what we do. God wants our hearts. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in Psalm 51... I love David's psalm, you know, when he, and it's such a great example of the kind of heart. Um, when he says um, in, in Psalm 51, I'm just going to read a couple of verses, 15 and 17, it says, Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. 
You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. And that psalm was what he wrote, according to the scriptures, right after he committed adultery and then second degree murder with Uriah, her husband. But he got the heart of God. And he was able to get broken about what he had done. But then he was faithful that God could heal him and put him back together. Yeah. As he went on, and, and go back and read that psalm. That's the heart. In Acts 13, it says that David had a heart that took after God's own heart. And I thought, wow. And then you look at some of the things he did, but you know, what is that heart? That faithful, humble heart. You know, we can't earn God's favor any more than we can jump across the Grand Canyon. Why? Because you already have God's favor. You don't have to earn God's favor. He, he, you have it, it's just to accept it with that broken and contrite heart. Now, another, another symptom, which is kind of related to the performance-oriented, uh, we talked about um, a symptom is, is being harsh and unforgiving, just like that first servant in Matthew 18. He says, I'll pay it all back, and then he goes off and he's harsh. Um, and then we talked about performance oriented, but another thing is being guilt motivated. Now, I don't know why, but I think women, we tend to struggle with this a bit more, and I do know some brothers that struggle with this as well, but we can be really bad at this. I know this is something uh, that I've really had to work through, and I've had some women in my life, like Terry Fontenot, that have really helped me with this concept. You know, we are commanded um, to be compelled by love, to love one another. The reason why we interact with God, interact with people is because we love, not because we feel guilty. In Revelations 12, 9 through 10, we read about how Satan is the great accuser. It says he's the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night, and he has been hurled down to the earth. When, I, when my motivation is out of guilt, then... I'm not following Jesus in that moment. I'm following Satan. And when that, that light bulb went off my head through discipling and great friendships, and when I realized that, and it was just sitting down at a conversation, I thought I was going to get help in my schedule. Um, and uh, I thought, tell me how to figure out, because I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed trying to do the ministry, work as a physician, and raise these four kids and keep the house up. And I was, uh, I was struggling. I thought, I'm overwhelmed. And I thought I'd need a little bit of help. But as I talked, what came out of my heart, you know, in, in Luke 12, uh, 34, it says, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. So I just spoke, and I spoke a lot. And, uh, and I said, you know, I feel, really, I, I feel really guilty about, you know, I'm not spending enough time with my kids, and I get my husband gets the leftovers, and I, I have all these numbers of women I need to reach out to, and I feel like, oh, I just feel so guilty about this. And I went on and on and on, and I remember Terry sitting back, and her eyes getting bigger and bigger, and, 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 then, and then I stopped talking, and she says, anything else? And I said, yeah, there's a couple more. Let me just tell you some more. <laughs> and she's like, well, one thing I noticed was you say I feel guilty a lot. And that's when I started having to go with the scriptures. I did not want to be led by guilt. The reasons why I would end up doing something was out of guilt. But I loved being a wife, and I loved being a mom, and I loved being a disciple, and I loved studying the Bible. with All the things that I love, I wasn't even enjoying, and I was just overwhelmed. But my motive, and I had to change the way I thought. I remember when I would start feeling guilty, I thought, okay. Because guilt is not a feeling. It's not supposed to be a feeling. It's a fact. If I'm in sin, I need to repent. If I'm not, I need to choose a priority. And I had to learn how to do that. And I, oh my goodness, that first week, I was doing it all the time. I was like, I felt, oh, no, I'm not going to feel guilty about that. And God gave me tons of different ways. I don't know if it was happening that often all the time where you thought, let me give you some, something to work with. But it really, and it's amazing. Nothing in my schedule changed, but I felt refreshed. And I realized when we're motivated by guilt, it's exhausting because and it doesn't last long because then you, um, because you get fulfilled, because guilt is really, when you're motivated by big guilt, it's more about self because you don't like that feeling, so you do it. But then there's something else right there to make you feel guilty again because it's never ending and, and, and it's exhausting. And so when I changed my thought process, it's not like it never rears, it is a little bit, you know, like it rears its ugly head here and there, but I know what to do with it now. 
and I know how to take it to the cross, and that it's not godly, and it's simple. I got to understand this. And when I don't understand grace, I can be motivated by guilt. Um, you know, grace, grace is not earned. It is not repayable. The other thing that grace is not, which is my second point here, grace is not a license to sin. You know, in Jude chapter 4, it reads, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Savior and Lord. A license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ. Now, for most of us sitting in here, that's Jude, Jude verse 4. Um, most of us in here, you know, we're probably not out there doing all those really obvious sins, but do you know how it pops up? There's a book, I don't know how many, have, have anybody read Jeff Bridges' Respectable Sins? It's a really good book. It's respectable sins. Well, of course, no sin is respectable. There is a play on words there. But it's what we think is less bad as some of these other sins. Things like worry. Oh, that's totally relatable. You know, I used to think worry. Well, I mean, I literally thought if I was up all night worried about somebody, it's because I cared about them. I did not think it was sin. I changed. You know, we worry about our kids, our career, our academics. We think, oh, that makes sense. I'm okay. Do we treat it like sin? Frustration. You know, uh, I appreciate Mira being open. I mean, if you're a mom in here, have you ever gotten frustrated with your kids? Okay. Right. Now, think about why do we show our frustration more easily with our kids? Why? Because we can. That's a scary thing. Because we can, would we show our frustration the same way if our boss was in the room? I remember one time I had just gotten off the, the phone with one, one of my bosses in the medical field, and um, I hung up. Maybe I redialed. But I was correcting my son, and I wasn't screaming. I wasn't doing it. I mean, I never would have even thought there was anything wrong with it at all, but I was correcting him. And then I looked down at my phone, and I saw... Um, I saw Dr. Lowry's name there, and I heard a hello, 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 and I looked at it, and I panicked, and I thought, hello, <laughs> and I thought, my kids looked at me like, did you just hang up on Dr. Lowry? And I think, yes, I did, and I was like, why did I do that? I did that because I realized that I would never have talked like that in front of him, and I never would have known it was bad. We've got to, like, these respectable sins. Um, you know, grace is not a license to sin. Our pride, you know, we, we, we confess it like, well, I was, I was really being insecure. I want to be open. But pride, that evilness. You know, it almost can sound a bit humble. That's false humility. Or an arrogance. We think, well, I'm just self-confident. You know, ingratitude or unthankfulness, self, lack of self-control, impatience, irritability, angry, judgment. I don't know uh, if any of you remember when Debbie Norman, she was here a few years working with the young marrieds, and she's from Canada, and she said something that stuck with me, and she said that um, sin is always understandable. Like, we can understand each other's sin completely because we're all sinners. And in the flesh, sin is the same. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, it says, no temptation has seized us except for what is common to all men. If temptation is common, then so is sin. We understand sin in each other, but it's completely unacceptable. And that's the part we need, we, we need to understand, but we can't ever accept it. Grace is not a license to sin. It is not repayable or earned. It is not, uh, it is not um, repayable. I've lost my picture up here. Um, Here's the mom being frustrated with her daughter here. Um, and the next thing, grace is not without effect. Oh, I lost it. Does somebody know how to fix this? <laughs> Any technical pros here? <laughs> anyway. Double click on your... Double click? Double click, see 
Here you go. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking. Um, but grace is without effect. We all know that passage. Uh, we've probably heard about that passage in 1 Corinthians 15 when Paul says, But the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. And that's kind of similar to the way I was feeling when I was being motivated by guilt. It was overwhelming. I was tired. It was so refreshing. I thought I had a new life. And all I did was change my perspective in something in my heart. I repented. But grace, when we get grace, it energizes us. Um, we get restored. You know, if we feel burdened and weary, some of that is life. And, and it's not just a misunderstanding grace, but it could be. Um, and in Isaiah 40, I love this passage when it says, uh, Isaiah 40, verse 28 through 31, it reads, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I love, that's one of my very favorite passages. Because I know we get weary. But God's grace strengthens us. It doesn't even talk about, it talks about, grace is not just forgiveness of sins. It's, it's his kindness and his love, his favor. It is huge. Um, and, and we've got to get this. We've got to understand this. These are the symptoms. You know, grace teaches us to say no to sin. You know, it has that effect. It, 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 um, it works hard for us. It strengthens us, and it teaches us to say no. And that's Titus 2, verse 11 through 14. reads, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-right, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the peering of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to be purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You know, when we're stuck trying to change something, um, a lot of times when we're in that cycle, you know, Colossians 2 is kind of the reverse. It talks about how just saying, stop it, don't do this, you know, in a legalistic way, that has no power to change anything. But God's grace, that's where the power is. And it's our understanding of God's grace that gives us the power, the strength to actually change. But we get it backwards. Um, and lastly, not only is grace not a license to sin, grace is not without effect, grace is not cheap. Grace is not cheap. It, it came at a huge price. Uh, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, he was a, uh, he was a um, German theologian. And he wrote an incredible book. Um, it's a pretty thick book, though. It, it's called The Cost of Discipleship. And he himself lived through tons of persecution um, in, in an amazing way. But he got this idea, and, he, and he, he coined this term of costly grace versus cheap grace. You know, in our culture today, you know, you'll see it where people feel like, I've been forgiven. But that doesn't, so I'm forgiven, so I don't have to. Like Mira was talking about the two extremes. But that is a lot of our culture. And we can do this. It's not just our culture out there. It can be a culture in here, too. Uh, even with some of these, quote, respectable sins. Um, but, you know, it's not just this divine get out of free. I remember when I was in college, before I even understood what discipleship was. I remember hearing my sweet mates talk about it, and they were partying, they were being immoral, they were doing this and, and sharing their faith, and I remember them saying that, and I thought, uh, but I was doing some of the same things, but just not as publicly, so I thought I was better. But I remember hearing that and thinking, there's something not right about this. But what she said was true, we are forgiven, so we, we can be graced, but it didn't feel right. Um, you know, grace, and our, as, as Christianity became more popularized and secularized, you know, became, grace became common property. 
And the gospel was cheap and obedience to the living Christ was gradually lost. And we see that in our culture. Listen to this. This is a quote from Bonhoeffer's book. He says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. <laughs> Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. And later he writes, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. You know, so we think that we can enjoy all these aspects of grace, but not, not follow Jesus. But that goes against everything. You know, it's like when I, you know, the Grand Canyon, you know, that, that 18 miles, like, okay, we can be on the back of the eagle and we can fly across that 18 miles. It's the only way it's going to happen. Because without our own, it's impossible. But the cost is, you got to leave the, that edge. You got to get on the eagle's back, and you can't go back to that edge. It's gone. There's a cost. It does cost something. You know, Luke 14, we read about that, counting the cost. Luke 25 to 33, a lot of us know that passage by heart. You know, when he says, um, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And he goes on, he talks about building a tower and why would you start if you knew you couldn't finish? And he talks about the army and you've got this many people, but here's God's army, it's way bigger. And it's a funny analogy, like thinking that we're, we can even compare ourselves to an army, God's army. Um, but, but there's just that sense of like, there is a cost. But the cost is, Okay, there's a cost by not accepting too. Yeah. Um, but there is a cost. It's not cheap grace. It's, you know, in 1 Peter um, chapter 1, verse 8, it reads, um, It wasn't with perishable things like gold or silver that you were redeemed from that empty way of life handed to you from your ancestor, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. This grace cost. It's not free. Sin is never, ever free. And grace, but you know what? When we appreciate, when we understand how precious grace is, it means so much more. It's not just seeing the amount of debt we have, which is huge, and not one person in this room understands how big our own debt is. If we saw all our sin at one point, we'd just fall over and we wouldn't be able to breathe. <laughs> but God shows us a little bit over time and lets us get married. You see a little bit more quicker and then, then you have kids and you see more. And, um, and sometimes it's your roommate. Sometimes it could be high school even. And, and dealing with peer pressure. It doesn't, but we can see our need through different things. Um, but, but it's also understanding how precious the need uh, but it's like that woman who comes back when she lost it and then comes back and she's overjoyed because she didn't really understand what she had until she thought she didn't have it. Uh, there's a story um, about a woman who's trying to sell um, an antique table. And she had a price tag on it, like $200, which is a pretty hefty price. And someone comes in and starts to bargain. And, um, and she, she's, she's trying to explain why it's $200. And she starts explaining the, the, the antique. She's like, well, it actually was an, in this, this time frame. And if you look at the carvings under here, and this is, this is where it stood. And, and then the refinishing. And she started talking about it and talking about it. And she talked about it. She started thinking, you know what? $200, that's just, it's just not the right price. I, I really can't let this go. It's got to be at least $600. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? You said you can't do that. And he's like, I'm really sorry. I changed my mind. This is, what, this is worth so much more. And the guy's like, but I want this table. It's going to be $600. And uh, then, he, then he buys it because he really wants it. But when he takes that table home, how do you think he's going to treat it? When something is worth more, you value it and you treat it. You want to protect it. This is how grace works. This is how grace has effect. When we value it, we see how valuable it is. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And if we can see the huge value of grace, 
then it will have all these things. Um, and I want to end in First Peter. Turn with me. First Peter chapter one. Um, starting in verse 6, it says, In this you greatly rejoice, in chapter 1, verse 6, Though now for a little while you may have had suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls an inexpressible and glorious joy you imagine when that wife came back and, and saw her husband whom she thought she was dead that inexpressible glorious joy nothing compared nothing compared to the grace that you have in your salvation. It is that valuable and that precious. And uh, what grace is not, in summary, it is not repayable, it's not earned. It is not a license to sin. It is not without effect, and it's not cheap. But it is precious and is freely given, amen. amen.